I'm delighted to be seeing so many names I know and even more names I don't know. How wonderful. And I hope you all stay for the Q&A and participate in the discussion that can follow the guided tour. Goed, ik denk het is uh, drie minuten na vijf. Gaan we beginnen? Hello, a very warm welcome to all of you in Germany, the Netherlands, the United States and elsewhere. My name is Michael Philip. I'm the chief curator of the Museum Barberini. I'm happy to welcome you to a very special event today, a curator-led online live tour with Gary Schwartz who is joining us from the Netherlands. I don't need to introduce him. He is worldwide well known as art historian and especially as a researcher about Rembrandt. So we have been very happy when he agreed some years ago to be the guest curator of uh, this show. Due to the pandemic situation, he was only able to visit the exhibition two weeks ago, but when he has been in Potsdam, we decided to organize this tour today. It is a very promising idea to walk with him through this exhibition, also it's only virtually. Like uh, all museums worldwide, also the Museum Barberini had to be closed during the COVID pandemic. So we introduced a new tool for art friends, a 360 degree tour, life led by an art historian of our guiding team. In the last weeks, we performed 350 of these digital tours with mm -hmm. nearly 16,000 participants. One of the very few advantages of the pandemic was that by this way, a lot of people were able to see, to see the exhibition who never would have come to Potsdam. They came from all over the world from Europe, South Africa, and even from a military base in Afghanistan. Mm. And maybe most of you wouldn't have made it to Potsdam also. So, but this tour today is very special, the most special tour of all of these 350. And that's enough from my side, now only some technical points. Please turn off your camera and mute your microphone during the tour. The presentation and the current speaker will be recorded. So if you have a question afterwards and you wish to remain anonymous, please ask your question in the chat. So this would be the most practical, practical form for questions anyway. And after the guided tour, I will present Gary the questions from the chat. So during the tour, Gary is assisted by my colleague, Peter Ernst. And now, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Michael. In, in my turn, I wish to thank the directors of the Museum Barberini and Kunstmuseum Basel, Rotul Westheider and Josef Helfenstein, for the trust they placed in me working for four years with their outstanding curators, Michael Philipp in Potsdam and in Basel, Bodo Brinkmann and Gabriel Detta has been a model for collegiality. Thanks today to the Barberini for putting at my disposal the services of guide Peter Erlings as navigator through the galleries and the supplementary PowerPoints that I've added as uh, in addition to some of the visual material. The inspiration to do an exhibition on the subject dates to a moment about 10 years ago in the Rembrandt house. This painting, which had been rejected by the Rembrandt Research Project, was being offered on loan and rehabilitated as a Rembrandt properly to the Rembrandt house. The museum asked me to come and talk to a number of journalists to explain to them the significance of this painting from the collection of Ilona and George Kramer. Uh, I did so very gladly. I told about the uh, importance of 
Oriental tronies, non-portrait faces uh, to Rembrandt's work in these years. And um, I spoke also about the importance of collectors like the Kramers being willing to share their treasures with the world. The Kramers have always been very generous that way. In the question answer period afterwards, uh, one of the journalists there, Eric Spahn, said, if you think this is such an important and interesting subject, why don't you do an exhibition on it? And he was also in touch with Michael Philip. Uh, I became involved and, uh, and that was the start. Well, this is, as I said, a trony. It's an anonymous sitter brought in from the street by Rembrandt and dressed up with a uh, uh, with a turban looking something like what he thought a an Eastern turban looked like. In fact, I only know of one genuine portrait of a person from the East, a visitor from the Orient, that was made by a Netherlandish artist in this the entire 17th century. And that is this engraving by Egidius Zadler. He's a very gifted Flemish printmaker who was working at the court of Rudolf II in Prague when it was visited by an envoy of Shah Abbas, Mahdi Kulibeg. Rudolf paid him the compliment of having his portrait engraved by Zadler. Pains were taken to have a Persian inscription on the sitter carved into the plate. The form of his plume was that prescribed in the form of Islam practiced in Persia, 12 or Shia. The respect was mutual. Shah Abbas and his successors also wanted to have artists from the Netherlands in their service. We will meet two of them later. Sadly, this gesture and its genuineness remained unmatched by anything produced in the Netherlands during the 17th century, north or south. It certainly never occurred to the States General to have portraits made of the Persian envoys who visited The Hague. Instead, Dutch artists gave us fictive Orientals. Sometimes we like our own projections better than what we can see in front of our eyes. This is what the projection looks like. Ferdinand Boll drawing inspiration from his master Rembrandt in a painting in the Milwaukee uh, uh, Museum of Arts, Milwaukee Art Museum. It's a common image, again, a Dutch studio model, very popular, inviting, undemanding, making itself available for indeed our own projections and in this case luscious with details of costume of weaponry uh, of, of clothing background the cover of the catalog for our exhibition was graced with another rembrandt throny which was first granted by the national gallery of art in washington but in the end because of the pandemic couldn't come well, let's leave the tronies for what they are and go to some of the other displays. And we're doing this in celebration of Rembrandt's 415th birthday today. So let's go to the spectacular first hall. A full length standing portrait, life size, two meters high for canvas, a format that in the 16th century was reserved for emperors, starting with Charles V and for kings, made available going down in society by steps, by Van Dyck for nobility in the early 17th century, also for Genoese nobility and then English, and then by Dutch artists, including Rembrandt for wealthy commoners. Well, let's have a look at this commoner. He was an administrator from Zutphen named Aswer Jacob Schimmelpenning van der Oye in a painting by Dirk van Loon. 
He was an administrator. He became one of the financial officials of the province of, of, uh, of in Zutphen, of Overijssel. His family was befriended with the great Admiral Cornelius Trom, and at the age of 27, Oswier sailed with him on the first stage of a pilgrimage journey to the Holy Land. He kept a detailed journal that was published in the in 1870s, and it revealed him to be traveling not really to the countries that he was passing through, but to a Christian Levant. He went to Old and New Testament locations, taking for granted that that's what they were, crusader churches and fortresses, and contemporary Christian life. Everywhere he went, he was reliving the incarnation of Christ and the Passion. I read an entry from his journal of 28th May, 1658. We took the sad walk, by which he means the Via Dolorosa, and saw the church of the Knights of Malta. The house where St. Peter was imprisoned is still a prison. Actualization of a mythic past. Every location was branded. Here's another one. A long mile from here, the Paters, and this must have been uh, Orthodox uh, Christian uh, Papas who were guiding them around, pointed out to us a large square ruin, which was the house of the righteous Simeon. The Holy Land was completely inscribed with Christian meaning, turned into tourist destinations, commercialized. Swimmel Pending calls all the locals Turks, he makes only a few passing references to mosques. He never went into one, nor did he say anything about the souks, like the one where he bought undoubtedly his kaftan of many colors. This is emblematic for the view of the Orient in Europe. Even in the Levant itself, walking in Eastern climes, a Dutch Christian like us were, was looking in the mirror. So what could be expected from the Dutch Christian artists who stayed at home? Asper isn't the only one in the picture. Attracting his own attention, he's looking at him, and perhaps more attention from the viewer than he himself, is his giant dog, put there for its irresistible picturesqueness, but also as a token of Asper's power to command. In any case, the dog steals the show from another man in the painting. And I'm taking the background color for my slides from the cover of the, uh, the jacket of the exhibition catalog. Standing behind the dog, looking at us where with deference is a man who was painted as an oriental. Whether he came to Holland with Oswer is not told in the painting or in the journal. The painting places the scene in the location meant to be seen as the east with a mountain in the background. So we do not know whether this portrait-like portrait image of a living Oriental was or was not a portrait from life. At the back of the first gallery, the doorway is flanked by two large paintings by Albert Karp. Both have the same buildup. Two groups of figures on the sides with a distant view between them. This is the kind of display that gives curators a thrill when setting up the hanging of an exhibition, but that is not why they are there. On the left is Albert Karp's portrait of the Sam family of Dordrecht, they were wine merchants, Jan Jacobs and Sam, and his wife, Katharina Wolfarts, stand on the left in front of the trees. And those are trees that show them symbolically to be the founders of a family tree, which is uh, grouped around them in the living progeny of their family. Our curiosity to know who the sitters are is only increased by its oriental touches. The turbans of the man on the upper left, 
the boy in the foreground and the young man on the right. What are they doing there in the middle of what looks like a, a realistic family picture? Well, the art historian John Lauman, uh, who discovered who the sitters were, advanced a theory about at least why the upper left man is graced with a turban. He was a man named Arant Hutanus, who married in 1653, the daughter of the main couple, the sons. She's standing beside him, between him and her father. And Lauman suggested that they are meant to look like the arch couple from the Bible, Isaac and Rebecca, who are often used as wedding portraits for uh, Dutch couples wanting to dignify their marriage themselves and to show that they're dedicating their lives to uh, God and uh, the higher things. The form known as a portrait historié, uh, a portrait in the form of historical characters. The dress of the figures on the right, Laman points out, are associated with the hunt, giving a kind of noble air to the family because the hunt was of course traditionally reserved only for the nobility. They're dressed in Eastern European clothing and then again with that oriental turban. A kind of hodgepodge here of sign symbols and associations. I can't help thinking of a detail in the portrait of Oswear Schimmelpenning, that is the letters. The sitter in the Sam portrait is pointing at a letter held by one of the other family members, as is the Oriental in the portrait of Oswear. The letters play a particular function as in any painting in which they are introduced. They punch a hole in the unity of time and space, place suggested by a static painting. There's a world out there. There's a time before the painting was made and the scene it shows when someone wrote a letter and brought it to the people in the painting. The other portrait by Karp, although it has the same general arrangement, is in a genre more like the classic portrait historier. It's the encounter of David and Abigail, portrait of the family of Lorais Jacobs Molesholt and his wife Janik and Janstorter Rokus, 1655. And it is in Basel in the Kunstmuseum where the exhibition first opened. Well, thanks to an entry in the inventory of the main sitter, we know exactly what this painting represents, an extraordinarily large painting with portraits of the deceased, his wife, children, and other members of their family portrayed as the story of David and Abigail. The actions of the figures do not correspond very well with the Bible story in which Abigail throws herself on the ground in front of David, saying, the Lord your God will certainly make a lasting dynasty for my Lord, because you fight the Lord's battles and no wrongdoing will be found in you as long as you live. This I think is the reason for the choice of this subject as the characters in a family group portrait, the founding of a dynasty. The Kaup is not my favorite group portrait historie in the exhibition. My favorite is on the adjoining wall. The wedding feast of Grietje Hermans van Hasselt and Jochem Bernsen van Haake in Utrecht in 1636. We know the date from the Central Museum in Utrecht. It shows the married couple, a mar uh, the newly married couple, as uh, Esther and King Achasveros, with Esther's cousin Mordechai at the table on the right. Uh, this identification is suggested and confirmed, I think, by the motif on um, the cloth behind the couple, which shows 
uh, stars all over and all over pattern. Uh, and the stars refer to the name Esther, which is the word for star in, in Persian. At the exhibition itself, while we were looking at the painting and enjoying it in real life, um, my own wife, Luki, pointed to a detail that I hadn't noticed before and asked me what it might mean. Looking into the background on the right, we see two figures, a woman running away, being chased by a man. Well, this comes right out of the book of Esther. Esther was not the first wife of King Ahasuerus. His first wife was Vashti. And she behaved in a particular way, not specified, which made her unfit to be a queen. And Ahasuerus had her dismissed from court, divorced her, and then took Esther as his wife. Another little symbolic detail is that Khritya is holding in her hands a pearl from her necklace. A pearl in Latin, Margarita, is the origin, of course, of the name. The painting is signed Ye van Hasselt, which is the same name as Gretje, uh, sorry. And uh, there are two painters who come into consideration, uh, Jacob van Hasselt, which the museum prefers, and Jan Lucas van Hasselt, which uh, I think absolutely must be the man. And um, this I'm following Leonard Slatkis, who wrote a book uh, on Rembrandt in Persia. This young Lucas van Hassel spent years at the court of the Shahs in Isfahan as a painter to the Shah. He participated in the kinds of banquets that is evoked here in the conviviality culture of the court in which this sort of event was part and parcel of the exercise of power. Even the court of Ahasuerus in Susan was probably thought of in the same terms as the Shah, uh, the court at Isfahan of the uh, of the Persian Shahs. But there's something else I have to tell you about Jan Lucas von Hasselt. He came to Isfahan with an Italian traveler named Pietro della Valle as an artist in his entourage traveling for years through North Africa, the Middle East, Persia, to Armenia, Syria. And in Syria, the Lavalle fell in love with and married a Christian woman named Siti Mani. Well, he had uh, Jan Lucas van Hasselt, of course, paint a full-length portrait of her, which van Hasselt chose to do in Syrian clothing. De La Valle kept a notebook of his own, a little journal, and he wrote annoyed, saying that CT didn't often wear clothes like that. He didn't see why uh, von Hasselt had to paint her that way. And he didn't think very much of uh, von Hasselt's talents either. I don't know why he kept them with him for all those years traveling around. Something remarkable happened on the trip. This was after Van Hasselt had dropped off and remained in Isfahan. Siti died in 1621 with Tolavale now planning yet to come back to Europe. He got back in 1624 and brought the body of his wife, Siti Vali, with him, Siti Mani. He had her embalmed on the road. And when we got back, he had a book published about her, of which we take this uh, image, and which is, of course, after Van Hassel's portrait. Uh, and he buried her in a ceremony in Rome. Again, at the exhibition, Luki asked me a question about the uh, book and about the painting, which I hadn't, rec hadn't noticed. There really are stylistic and physiognomical resemblances between Siti and Khritya that I think strengthen the attribution to Jan Lukas. I can, I'm looking forward to your opinion about this in the Q&A. But this painting, more than just for its intrinsic interest, is also important for its impact on none other than Rembrandt. <clears throat> Yeah.
Here is Rembrandt Samson posing the wedding guests, so his own wedding, to the Philistine uh, men at the wedding. Well, he was praised for this particular image by the Leiden artist, Philips Angel, in an official meeting of the Leiden Painters Guild in 1642. Rembrandt, he said, thought deeply about the meaning of the story. He read the Bible text carefully. He did research into the behavior of people in the East and found out that they didn't sit at table the way we do, but reclined. And that's why he showed Samson in this pose and the other guests. So he brought Rembrandt to the fore in his lecture published in 1642 as a model for who history painters should take seriously uh, the uh, subjects which, which they paint. My only regret with regard to the hanging of the exhibition is that these two paintings were not shown next to each other. Needless to say, Rembrandt didn't copy the von Hassel literally, but it cannot be doubted that he knew it and made use of the pictorial concept. With all these Christians dressing up as Old Testament Jews, it's nice to look at the way a Dutch Jew presented himself. Far from historical, Don Francisco Lopez Suazo, around 1675, in a painting belonging to the Amsterdam Museum, but on loan to the uh, Jewish Historical Museum in Amsterdam, shows himself in the latest French fashion of the court of Louis the Fourteenth, emphatically as a present day European with ties not only to the French court, but also the Dutch. He's holding in his hand an orange to show of his ties to the Stadtholder King Willem. What is Oriental is the Persian carpet, which is something that Francisco could order and own. Well, what we've seen so far can be called innocent appropriations of the Orient. Here is a less innocent one. <clears throat> Go through the door and there is another full length, life-size standing portrait. Caesar van Everdingen's portrait of Wollebrand Gelijns de Jonge, 1674 in the Alkmaar Museum. We can say some disarming things about the man. He was an orphan, a self-made man, brought up in the orphanage of Alkmaar, to which he bequeathed this fabulous painting when he had it made the year before his death. He worked for the Dutch East India Company, the VOC, not only as a merchant, but also as an aggressive military commander attacking an island in the Persian Gulf, just in order to make a better deal with them in negotiations. If Oswer Schimmelpenning's relationships with Easterners was facultative, he could take them or leave them on his pilgrimage, Wollebrand's Warren, he had very wrought contact with the peoples of the East among whom he lived. And we see him being domineering uh, and uh, taking charge of their countries and their lives. After the exhibition was mounted in Basel, a few weeks later, I got a long email well thought out and carefully argued by uh, two women who saw the show, Lucy Duchan and Selena Steinemann. And they were incensed that we held an exhibition on this subject without calling attention emphatically to the colonialism and racism that it implies. Now, we thought about this, it isn't as if we were uh, 
uh, oblivious to this aspect of things, uh, but in calling the exhibition Rembrandt's Orient and in presenting it in an historical or historical sense, we thought we would respect the attitudes of the people in of the time in the paintings. And in writing back to uh, Lucy and Serena, uh, I sort of played the ball back at them. And I said, well, you know, you want me to condemn colonialism and racism, but there's a lot more wrong with what we're showing. And here I'm quoting from my own mail. Why don't you take me to task for not browbeating visitors to the exhibition to wake up to the long suppressed evils of how Dutch exploitation of the natural resources of Asia contributed to the deterioration of the environment or why the stimulation of consumer culture by the import of expensive products that nobody needed led to the hollowing out of Western civilization. What about the Dutch role in spreading the smoking of tobacco and causing millions of deaths to lung cancer? or foisting off cheap sugar on us, so ob obesity is killing millions more. What about Christians bossing Muslims in India around for 350 years and how it led to the clash of civilizations? And shouldn't we have lambasted the financing of the Dutch enterprise in East India, which as the first major limited liability company stood at the birth of capitalism and all the inequalities and injustices it engendered? Did anyone even ask how old were those Indian and Turkish and Moroccan and Japanese girls, none of them in Dutch colonies, who spun the silk yarn that went into those gorgeous blouses, the little girls who wove those exquisite carpets, printed that flashy chintz, sewed those chic robes? End quote. While all of that may be true and relevant, and I got myself worked up on it, in ways that could come to the fore in future discourse. Maybe we will get just as excited about the deterioration of the environment as we do now of the deterioration of society and in, in, in slavery. But I must admit, it does not eliminate the fact that was brought to my attention by these ladies that Dutch behavior and some of the imagery as in this portrait glorify white domination of Oriental and African peoples. Just look at the uprooted Africans serving Wollebrand. Awareness of these evils has been growing. The exhibitions in the Rembrandt House, Black in Rembrandt's Amsterdam, and Slavery in the Rijksmuseum came into being in consultation with members of the affected communities. We didn't see this as a possibility for us. I mean, we were doing these fantasy orientals and I don't think that any of the living uh, Turkish immigrants in Turkey would have seen themselves as being reflected appropriately by them as one of the reasons why we, we didn't do that. But I must say that if I were beginning today to give form to an exhibition on this theme, I would have taken a more critical stance. So thanks to Lucy and Serena for engaging with me in this discussion. If this heroic self-image bypasses some less attractive realities, this extends even to the paintings of armed conflict. They never show attacks on relatively defenseless islanders in the East. Instead, as in this painting by Jacques Muller of a cavalry encounter between Turkish troops and the troops of the Habsburg Empire around 1645 in the Rijksmuseum, they tend to glorify the Oriental foe. They want to show the enemy as being brave and worthy of being uh, fought, but also strong enough to have brought, put up a worthy battle, making themselves look better. In this case, it actually, it isn't even an enemy. The uh, uh, Turks here are fighting a Habsburg force. The Dutch in 1645 were still at war with the Habsburgs, and they saw themselves as allies of the Turks. So that uh, it's a mixed bag of meanings and associations, but still 
doesn't say anything about the realities of military encounters uh, in which the Dutch engaged. If we found surprisingly few battle scenes with Orientals, there were that many more Orientalist biblical subjects. <clears throat> This is one of the richest of all, with a wealth of personal and institutional associations. It's signed Peter Lassmann Inventor, Thomas de Keyser, Pinksit, Painter, 1660. What it is, is a painting in the deed, indeed by Thomas de Keyser of a composition by Peter Lassmann. Lassmann had designed a stained glass window for the Zouderkerk in Amsterdam to be donated to the church by the Goldsmiths Guild of Amsterdam. The Zouderkerk was the first church to be built in the Protestant denomination in Amsterdam in the Netherlands after the, uh, the Catholic uh, faith had been driven out of the churches. Most of the Protestant Reformed churches in the country were built in the Middle Ages for Catholic worship. And this one, the Zouderkerk, was the first one especially built uh, for the Dutch Protestants. And in putting this painting up uh, in the form of stained glass in the church, the Goldsmiths Guild was, of course, conducting a piece of prominent product placement, putting these gorgeous gold and silver vessels of the kind that they manufactured into the story of King Cyrus returning to the temple in Jerusalem, uh, precious objects that had been stolen by his predecessors who had conquered uh, the country of the Jews uh, to the uh, uh, to Shesh Bazar of the, the, the temple in Jerusalem. Now, it's full not only of these institutional connections and associations, but also personal ones, because uh, Peter Lassmann's brother was Zeher, the head of the Goldsmiths Guild. He was the one who uh, paid for the window and of course uh, commissioned uh, uh, Peter to paint it. And uh, Thomas de Kaiser was the son of Hendrik de Kaiser, who was the architect who built the Zara de Kerr. You wish that for every painting in the show, we had this kind of information, this kind of association, these ties that are able to bring home and make vivid, make personal, make more alive for us uh, what is happening and what is being shown. We try to fill it in otherwise, and there's more, I'm sure, to be found out about it in this case, but mostly we're left just to guess, guess at, uh, what's being shown. When Lassmann designed his window for the Zauder Kerk, he lived across the street from it. There it is. And now, having lost not uh, lost also its meaning for the Protestant denomination, has turned into a uh, center for events. You can hire it uh, for probably not too much money. That was the arrow is now pointing at Lassmann's house, which is Rembrandt's first house in Amsterdam. He came to Lassmann as a trainee pupil in the 1620s at the age of 18 or 19, right across from the Zara Kerk. When he came back to Amsterdam as a fully uh, practicing artist, his first address there was with Hendrik uh, Allenberg's house on the uh, St. Antonis Breestraat, right over there. And uh, he bought his own house a few years later, right there. This was how small Rembrandt's Amsterdam was, and what a worldwide reach it uh, developed. But it's it's really always 
fascinating to see these kinds of connections and to think about the neighborhood, about the people who live there, about what they meant for the artists, their art, and the events and institutions taking place around them. That Lossman took his pupil Rembrandt across the street to look at his stained glass window may be taken as an incontrovertible fact. And Rembrandt was thinking of his master's glass stained glass window when in 1641 he etched his triumph of Mordechai, which he gave in the center the same kind of arch with the same kind of domed structure in the background. Uh, it isn't only the background view that derives from last month. Lassmann's own triumph of Mordechai was also in Rembrandt's visual memory when he made his etching. Rembrandt made no secret of his adaptations of motifs from his master work, his master's work. Anyone familiar with Lassmann's art and the stained glass window was known to all will have seen Rembrandt's etching as in part a tribute to his deceased master, who was one of the heroes of Amsterdam painting. You see that he's taken also the figure of Haman leading Mordechai on horseback through the streets of Susan. This wasn't the beginning of Rembrandt's borrowings from last month. In art history, this is the most famous early derivation. It's Billion's ass balking at the angel, painted in 1622 by Lassmann, a painting that was uh, that is now in the Israel Museum. I think it was donated to it by uh, Richard Feigen, the recently deceased art historian, uh, art dealer, and art historian. Rembrandt in 1626 painted his own version of the subject, taking over and manipulating, revising, reworking, rethinking the details from Lassmann's painting and his own work in the Musée Cognacier in Paris. It's wonderful that we have pertinent information concerning the first owner of this painting. There's a letter from 1641 telling from Paris about the pending evaluation of the painting by its owner. That owner was a remarkable man and who uh, bought the painting from Rembrandt himself. It was a man named Alfonso Lopez, who was uh, a Portuguese Jew who came to France and made a great career there, rising as a jeweler to have a near monopoly on the polishing of the most important gems to come to the French court and the French aristocracy. But being commissioned by Cardinal Richelieu to come to the Netherlands to buy uh, ships and armaments for the French Navy from uh, Dutch uh, manufacturers and ports. Now, his position in France as a converted Jew is really comparable to the position of Billiam in the painting. Billiam was not Jewish. He was called in to perform a curse on the Jews, which he didn't do. God got him to do, uh, to say a blessing, but he was looked down on while being appreciated by both the Jewish and the Christian communities of the Bible readers of Rembrandt's age. And it is easy to see how Alfonso Lopez uh, could have seen this painting in personal terms. And so another of these precious connections that allow us to uh, bring a otherwise more or less anonymous history painting into uh, a, 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 a into a social and personal uh, connection. Lassman was only one of the Amsterdam painters who could serve Rembrandt as a model 
in an Orientalist mode. Peter Lossmann's sister, Achnita, was married to the artist Francois Venant, who had a campy variant on the signature Lossmann style. Here is David taking leave of Jonathan in Venant's version on the right, about 1630 in the Fondation Custodia in Paris, from which we were pleased to get a number of important loans. And on the left, a painting that wasn't in the exhibition, uh, Lassmann's version of David taking leave of Jonathan about 1620 in the Pushkin Museum in Moscow. They are referred to, these artists, by a name that has entered the literature that I never use, but which may be familiar to you. And that is pre-Rembrandtist. I have to admit to an aversion to all anachronistic period designations like Baroque for reasons I won't go into here, but free Rembrandtist strikes me as particularly indefensible. <clears throat> as if the artist who provided Rembrandt with his main early inspiration only derived their significance from that fact. In fact, they were the ones who inspired Rembrandt, not the other way around. One of those artists was Jacob Pinas, of whom it was said by Arnold Haubrock in Rembrandt's uh, early biographer that he was one of Rembrandt's actual masters. Here is Abraham receiving the three angels about 1618 from a private collection, which happens to be the private collection of Luki, and they were very happy to be uh, in charge of this painting for our time. Another major source for Rembrandt's introduction to Orientalism is to be found in the work of Peter Paul Rubens. Here is a famous early comparison of Rembrandt and Rubens. Widely known throughout Europe is an engraving by Lucas Forstermann after Rubens' painting now in Lyon of the Adoration of the Magi. Rembrandt borrowed more than one motif from it. In his small panel of 1626 in Kunstmuseum Basel of David bringing the head of Goliath to Saul, Rembrandt has the tail of Saul's cloak held up by a page, a motif from the Rubens composition. I cannot resist showing you another Rubens Rembrandt comparison in two paintings we requested for the exhibition but didn't get. In Kassel hangs the fabulous Rubens portrait of an Antwerp merchant who traveled to the east, Nicolas de Respagna. It was painted around 1620 and never reproduced in a print. And then in 1631, in his only full length self portrait, not at all life size, it's not that large, Rembrandt painted himself in de Respagna's pose. If you reverse the image, you can see more clearly. Uh, yeah, how similar the pauses are. And this piece of evidence wondering about how Rembrandt could have known that painting makes me suspect that Rembrandt visited Rubens in Antwerp in the win winter of 1630-31, the hypothesis I cannot yet prove. Well, okay, returning to the loans we did get, here is one of those we are most proud to bring in. Rembrandt's Woman Taken in Adultery of 1644 in the National Gallery in London was evaluated at one of the highest prices of any of his paintings. It takes place in the temple in Jerusalem, which Rembrandt evokes in glamorous mystery. Here too, he avoids authenticity by ignoring the three-dimensional model of the temple by a Jewish scholar that could be visited around the corner from his house in Amsterdam. It was actually visited by royal visitors from England. And somehow Rembrandt had a, a dislike for the uh, model that was of course famous and known to him. 
What he preferred was an imaginary architecture. Can we see the detail? Hmm. Rembrandt's architecture is another subject awaiting an exhibition if there are any museum directors in the audience. Well, this is the height of Rembrandt's Orientalism in the 1640s. The ultimate high point was reached in the 1650s. From the Albertina in Vienna, we were able to borrow one of the 23 surviving drawings of 25 that Rembrandt made in the 1650s or 60s after miniatures from the imperial atelier of the Mughal emperors in India. Because the Getty Museum mounted an exhibition of all of them in 2019, it was difficult to convince the repositories to lend them again. So we are particularly grateful to the Albertina. A loan that was granted, but which had to be withheld on account of Corona was a Mughal original of the type that was Rembrandt's model. It's in the Chester Beatty Library in Dublin. The comparison reveals the extent of the reduction Rembrandt exercised. There are no colors, no adornment. The details are indicated summarily and the framing in which such miniatures are usually mounted is left out. In the catalog, I propose that this drawing and the others were made for the owner of a Mughal album as a memento and not as an expression of interest by Rembrandt himself. This is an issue in which I'm debating with my colleagues and hope to get further with. But appreciation for Indian art in Europe here in you know, this delimited form was not widespread and had other kinds of limitations. Perhaps one or two of Rembrandt's models, and in any case, dozens more, were clipped up by Viennese interior designers in the 18th century and pasted onto 60 cartouches to be installed in the walls of a room in Schönbrunn Palace, known as the Millionenzimmer. It was called the Millions Room, not for the miniatures, but for the palisander wood of the paneling. So even into the 18th century, these precious products of the Mughal Imperial Workshop were valued less on their own artistic terms than what they contribute to the decoration of the palace of a European empress. I'm grateful to the Schoenbrunn curator, Elfrida Ibi, for showing them all to Luki and me in the freezing attic of the palace and arranging for the loan of two of them. Here too, the originals are emasculated and made to serve Western interests. There was another artist beside Rembrandt who had access to the same miniatures as he. The Victorian Albert Museum holds one of the magnificent fantasies of Willem Schellings on the right. In which the motif of a drawing of the emperors Akbar and Jahangir in the sky is incorporated into a pageant of Indian court life as it never existed. So the drawing, which were portraits of the real Akbar and Jahangir is now turned into a heavenly vision while the animal fantasy below is painted by Schellenks as a real life event. Well, not all images of the East for fantasy, and now there's one of the most uh, authentic and culturally important of the images of the East ever to be made by a Dutch artist. In 1651, the Leiden artist who had praised Rembrandt for his research into Eastern usages in 1642, Philips Angel, found himself on a Dutch East India Company mission from the Persian coast 
to Isfahan, where he was to become a court painter to Shah Safi. On the way, he made the first drawing by a European artist of the ruins of the palace of Darius at Persepolis. Angel himself had only disparaging remarks to make about Persepolis, and no one who knew his drawing took it seriously enough to publish it until three quarters of a century later. We have this uh, uh, copy from the Amsterdam University Library in 1728. This was typical of the mixed reception of knowledge concerning the East, which extended also, of course, to Islam. There was lots of curiosity concerning Islam, and the Quran was translated a number of times, including a retranslation into Dutch from a good French translation of the 1650s. But no publisher in the West could bring out the Quran or bring out the book on the life of Muhammad without giving a title ridiculing the religion and its founder. In the exhibition, we show the first Quran edition with illustrations from 1696. Four of the illustrations are respectful images of how the artist thought Muslims engaged in prayer, the postures and the attitudes taken uh, by Muslims in uh, worship. The other two are scurrilous stories uh, of how Muhammad was being exposed as a fraud and a fake. And they went into the same edition, perhaps as an alibi for the publisher to keep uh, from being prosecuted for furthering uh, the false religion of uh, Islam in the West and encouraging what is now being touted by some European politicians as the threatening Islamization of Europe. Other publications of Eastern knowledge as these title pages of books on Asia and India are captive to convention, stereotype, rhetorical devices, uh, symbols that have nothing to do with uh, Asia in their day. The most unfeigned, sincere love of the real Orient is found not in stories, not in scholarship, or history paintings, or portraits, but in things still lives of precious collector's items from the East, like this magnificent Willem Kalf from the Stoutens Museum in Copenhagen of 1758, of 1678, are the most true to life images by Dutch artists we have. They epitomize the high selectivity characterizing Rembrandt's Orient, winnowing out the objects and the materials that fit best into one's own culture, and turning them into things that belong to us. The Dutch National Library and Leiden University have launched a program on the Dutch in Asia they call shared cultural heritage. There is a sense in which this is true, but another in which sharing is not the right word. One does not sense in any of the works we have seen this afternoon a desire by the Dutch bosses, patrons, or artists to share anything with the sources, human sources, countries that gave, uh, gave birth to the natural wonders, craft products and artistic wealth that the Westerners have appropriated, purchased or seized. In the long run, this may yet come to pass. I can see a time when we will become just as incensed about the deterioration of the environment that is implicit in many of these images uh, as the racism and colonialism that uh, they show. The displays in our exhibition are there indeed for the sharing. Well, what does it all mean? It's easy to poo-poo the Dutch culture creators and consumers of the 17th century for their self-importance. Look at that. Here's Rembrandt 
being as self-important as anyone could possibly be. Posing as an Eastern ruler with the power of life and death over his subjects. But in the course of making the exhibition and thinking about it now that it's here and almost gone, I find that it's myself that I'm relativizing. How much broader is my own conception of the East? Until a year and a half ago, I had never heard of or had never paid attention to, if I did hear of it, a city named Wuhan with a population two thirds the size of the Netherlands. The thing to do, if you can do it, is to admit that my own world is just as much a bubble as was that of Rembrandt's Orient to him and his contemporaries. It's not the kind of bubble that can be pricked to burst, I think, but I should be able to blow it up larger and make it reflect more colors and more images, not only reflections in my own face. Thank you. And now on to the Q&A. So thank you very much, Gary. It was very inspiring going with you through this exhibition. Also, it was only virtual, but uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I liked it uh, very much. I enjoyed it. So, and uh, I would uh, invite uh, the colleagues to, and, and the participants of this guided tour to ask questions or to give comments. Uh, you can write it uh, down in the chat or you would uh, um, do it live, so. Well, let me respond first to the first chat that came in she, by Leonor von Slota from the Rembrandt House, which uh, when it popped up on my screen kind of discombobulated me there for a second. Uh, she points out that the arrows that I had mounted on my detail of the map of uh, uh, 1625 uh, uh, placed wrong. I should have placed the arrow pointing to Hendrik Allenberg's house closer. Uh, it's at the corner. Apologies. Who else will unmute himself and say hello? Well, maybe me. Hello, Tom, Milo, Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. Hello, Gary. Hi, Tom. Um, I, I looked at the, f uh, I was struck by the, one of the first images you showed that had a, mm -hmm. a pages of Arabic text. There wasn't Arabic, it was Persian. No, per and I could see that, but the script mm -hmm. was Arabic. Yes. The script was Arabic, the, the language is Persian. But my comment is that, to my knowledge, uh, not a single European scholar or traveler has ever mastered Arabic script mm. to a local uh, level. And um, uh, you know that I'm I'm involved in the, um, uh, the digital rendering of it, and it's it has always intrigued me that there was no expertise in Europe to advise de developers of, of printing type mm -hmm. to the quality and the, the requirements of Arabic script, and and now that low result is dominating in the digital world. Well, look, what happened in that print, what I think uh, is involved is it could only have been the Persian participants in the mission who had a callig calligrapher in their, uh, in their numbers. And he uh, drew those, uh, uh, those characters and they had to be engraved by a European engraver. Yeah, because... so, so there was a compromise involved, but still, I think the most authentic piece of Arabic lettering you'll see. In yeah, the there are two parameters when you look at Arabic script, apart from the language. That is the, uh, the script grammar, the rules how to connect the letters, and there is the calligraphic quality. Mm. And the script grammar is there, but the, the calligraphic quality is completely gone in, in, oh. in the example that you showed. <laughs> okay, sorry to hear that, Tom, but thanks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, thank you. Are there any more 
remarks. No, no questions at all. Uh, I have a question. Yeah, please. Gary, uh, very much enjoyed this and applaud the exhibition um, and your reflections also on how, uh, how it could have been done uh, even better. I um, hope to see it uh, in the coming day or two. But uh, I was just wondering, you're alluding to discussions about the miniatures. Maybe you could fill us in a bit more on um, what the, how the debate is, is mm -hmm. moving ahead. Well, this was a totally unique project. You know, 25 copies that Rembrandt made after existing works of art. The only other copies he made were things after famous works by Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper, after Mantegna, over after Durer. So uh, I was looking or thinking, not even, you know, had not wondered about this for so long. Uh, what would have been the background for this? And I realized that it was a lot more like the behavior of a collector rather than the behavior of an artist to want to have a set of these 25 uh, images. And looking for a collector, there was one in Rembrandt's immediate vicinity that was Johannes Autobochardt, who we know took over items that was own, owned by Lady Arundel in Amsterdam. And one of her possessions was a, an album of Mughal uh, miniatures. So I'll, I'd love to talk to you about this, David, and I'll, I'll show you uh, uh, and it's in the catalog to more of the materials that I bring to bear on, on this uh, proposition. Great, thanks. Thank you. Okay, there are no more questions, no more comments. Well, it's time for a drink then in honor of Rembrandt's birthday. Okay, so we, we will do that. Uh, for all of you uh, who haven't seen the exhibition yet, uh, it is open until Sunday, only until uh, next Sunday, and then it will be closed. But as Gary um, um, mentioned, the catalog, this will be uh, available uh, also in further times. It's available in German and also in English. So uh, you can order it in uh, every bookshop. So uh, then Gary, Thank you very much for this guided tour. I'm very happy to have joined it. And thank you uh, all participants for your interest and uh, uh, participating in, in this guided tour. And yes, I, I wish you a very nice evening celebrating uh, Rembrandt's birthday. So right. thank you and goodbye. Bye all. Bye. Bye, Gary. Bye. 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 <laughs> Hope to see you soon. Yeah. 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 Bye, Gary. Uh, bye, Jeff Barbara. Bye, uh, Thank you so bye. much. Fascinating again. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm the host, so I'm going to have to end the session now. Bye bye.